Hey everybody, John Deere here, and I just want to uh, say hi and a uh, big call out to all of our replay viewers, people who have come in after the fact. Uh, we hope we're live right now. Uh, give us a little thumbs up or see if we, uh, we are live. Uh, we've had a few technical issues along the way today, but hopefully we are all good. Uh, as I mentioned before, I am so looking forward to when we have uh, fiber actually in our house. We are uh, under the good graces of Lakeside International School and they have allowed us to come in and use their high speed internet. So very, very thankful for that. And uh, today's topic is actually small lettering. It's one of those things that people struggle with over and over. and. Uh, the one thing I want to ask right off the bat is what do you consider small lettering? Just how small is small? Whether it's upper or lower case, so hopefully somebody will give us some comments. Are we live? I believe so. Yeah. Okay, I think we're live. Um, anyways, uh, so how small is small? I want to know, you know what you think small lettering actually is because that can really vary depending on you know how small you want to go with embroidery. Uh, the other thing I, I want to ask out there, because some of you have been following our ESA fonts, uh, we do, as a reseller for Hatch, we have fonts for the Hatch software and for the Wilcom platform and the Genomi platform, and I've been digitizing a ton of fonts over the last two years. And I just wanted to find out who can guess how many fonts I've done in the last two years. It has been a lot. So we'll, we'll let a few people uh, comment on that as well. Now, one thing I, I did want to talk about before we get into actually fonts themselves is uh, some things to consider when you're doing embroidery with small fonts. And one of them would definitely be the fabric type. And I'm sure if you've been embroidering for a while, you will agree with me that not all fabrics react the same way to small lettering as other fabrics do. You can be on a drill or a denim material and you can go tiny, tiny nylon material, you can go tiny with your letters, but then you start getting into like golf shirt material, PK knits and jersey knits. Uh, then you start getting into fabrics that have a higher pile on them, fleeces, and of course terry cloth. And there you have to realize that there are some limitations on the size of the font that you're going to do based on the fabric that you're choosing. So that's one thing that you have to kind of you know, get around uh, at the very beginning is what size is the smallest you can go on, let's say, terry cloth compared to a drill material. Uh, the other thing that I think you should consider is the stabilizers that you use. Using the right stabilizers for a job will help increase the quality of your embroidery and your actual lettering. Now one of my favorite stabilizers, and I, I have a sample over here, I'll be back in one second, is a no-show mesh. This is my personal all-time favorite stabilizer. I use it on most things. Uh, I do use tearaways, I use tearaway washaways, but this is a very lightweight mesh stabilizer. It comes in fusible and non-fusible, and it actually has like little tire tracks on it, a grid, and it's incredibly strong in both directions. So this will really help if I'm trying to do small lettering. The other thing is the toppings that you use. Uh, I'm a big fan of using water-soluble toppings whenever I'm doing small text as well. It helps, especially when you're talking about milled materials like knits, uh, it really helps to keep those edges clean on the satin stitches that are created in the lettering, and it helps to kind of increase on the, uh, the density without increasing the density. It just makes your lettering look a little cleaner and a little crisper and sharper, so I'm a big fan of that. We actually did a little video about uh, water-soluble stabilizers, and I, I actually uh, used a tennis ball. If you haven't seen that one, go to our YouTube channel and uh, take a peek. We had, I think, uh, like 4,600 people view that one, and it's a great tip that we used to do in the commercial days. Now, another thing that we used to do commercially is, and a lot of people don't know this, but we used to slow our machines down sometimes when we got to smaller lettering. 
Uh, keep in mind we were using you know commercial machines, rotary hook timing. Uh, they were multi-needle machines. So if you have a multi-needle machine, or even on a flatbed uh, machine with a drop-in bobbin, if you get really small text and you reduce the speed of the machine down to the the slowest it can go there won't be as much pull on the bobbin as there is running at higher speeds. So I remember in production, we would a lot of times, when we got to really tiny text, we would slow the machine down to make sure that the lettering uh, got crisper and cleaner. Now, another thing that I've uh, heard people say is to use a different thread weight. And I know that uh, standard thread weight is 40 weight, and most people use 40 weight thread and there are suppliers more and more now that do have 60 weight threads and I think that's a wonderful thing keep in mind that you would have to you know pr most likely or it's preferred if you change your needle uh, based on the thread weight so I might use a 7511 for a 40 weight thread and I might go to a 7010 or a uh, 659 if I'm going down to a 60 weight thread but if you are using thinner threads to create smaller text what you have to remember is that you need to increase the density of the design. Uh, just using a font that you may have purchased, and if it was digitized for 40 weight thread and you're using 60, it might look a little sparse when it actually comes out and embroiders. So the, the fonts need to be digitized specifically for lighter weight threads. Uh, personally, I have very, very rarely ever changed the weight of my thread. Uh, partly because I get pretty good results using a 40 weight. Uh, we had to uh, but in the old days, but the main reason why is when we were commercial embroiders and we had a 24 head machine that had you know between six to nine needles on it, that's a lot of needles. And to change over needles based on you know smaller weight thread and then have to change them back and keep track of all that, it would have been just too much for us to monitor, especially given the fact that we had employees who were running the machines and sometimes they might not pay attention and then you could really be in trouble. So uh, the other thing to consider as well about the size of a letter is the actual nature of the font. And what I mean by that is, did, did anybody do any guessing, Jennifer, as far as how many fonts I've actually created over the last uh, couple years? We had one person guess. Anybody else want to guess? Anybody else we... guess before I actually say how many fonts? They, uh, they guess 5,000. 5,000. Wow. I would not have slept a wink in two years, actually. I've probably digitized thousands of fonts in my career. Uh, but in the last two years alone, I've done almost 600 ESA fonts for uh, the Hatch software. And it's, it's kind of funny because I did digitize ESA fonts commercially 25 years ago, never thought I'd do it again. And then with uh, Hatch coming on board and us being a reseller, I knew that the ESA technology was just going to blow people away. And I started really going at it. I, there was a point we were doing 10 fonts a week. Now, with regards to the nature of a font, you have to remember that not all fonts are created equal. And really, I mean that, created equal. Different fonts can have different attributes. Some fonts may have little serifs on them and they might be more stylized. Some might have very thin uh, you know, widths on the actual strokes of the fonts. Others might be you know, a little bit uh, thicker and more conducive to smaller sizes. So when I create a font, the first thing I do is I bring that artwork into my software and I zoom into it, I blow up to my set scale and I assess, just by experience, how small I think that font could go. And really for me, that's the determining factor when I'm creating a font, is how small it is. Not necessarily how large it is, but more so how small. But small fonts are even more difficult than a regular font. Most of the fonts that we've done are between 10 millimeters up to almost 60 millimeters in height, depending on how detailed they are. And I'll be honest with you, a larger font scales up much better than a smaller font scales up. And I'm going to get into a few of the reasons why that happens. Now, the other thing to consider as well, besides the nature of a font, is the law of embroidery, or the law of an embroidery machine, which is an embroidery machine works on the principles of tension. 
you have the top thread that's pulling tension, you have the bobbin that's pulling tension, and that gives you pull. And that's where we have the term pull compensation. So the wider the stitch, the more pull that happens. But what people don't realize is that on the open ends, the, you know, the end of a letter I at the top and the bottom, you actually have an open end where you could slide a pin down in that open end. That's actually where you get something called push. And the push always stays the same. Now, if you look at a really tiny font, and you look at it and you zoom in on screen, you'll probably see that it has a little bit of a dancing bass line. The O's are a little bigger than the I's, and the bottom of an L is a little lower than the top of the L, and that's because of that push and pull that's happening with the embroidery. So there's a lot of things to consider. Now, the other thing that I'll talk about before I get into actually creating fonts, because I'm gonna give you a little example of that, is I'm gonna talk about what most people are doing in the home industry, because there is only a small amount of people who are actually digitizing. I mean, I, I got to be honest, I love to digitize, it's my passion, but the reality is only 10% of the people out there really want to create their own designs. And I, I totally understand that and I appreciate that. And if you're one of those people who does not want to create your own designs, then please put our, us, you know, ultimatestash.com on your design list because we just happen to create embroidery designs that run great on machines. So I'm all for people who don't want to necessarily learn how to digitize, but most people out there do have software. And within that software, there is actually keyboard fonts. And you have to remember that you don't necessarily have to digitize your own fonts, you can use keyboard fonts. And very quickly, I wanna go over the three different types of fonts that are available in the industry right now. Uh, there is what I would call or classify as stitch file fonts. These are fonts that you may have purchased from a company and you bring them into your software and you have to drag a font in and drag another font in and drag another font in and to be honest, it's, it's a little you know, cumbersome. You, you end up having to spend a lot of time to do a layout and you, know, you buy a font pack and after you're done two or three, you're like, wow, that was a lot of effort for the results. So uh, you know, stitch file fonts, that's basically what you get. Now, a couple years ago, there was a new, I guess, version out there that kind of appeared, and it was actually a, a pretty great idea. A company actually decided to take all of those stitch files, all the companies out there that had digitized fonts, and they gave them a tool which would help them to assign a keystroke to each of the letters and work within the software program. And they're called BX fonts. And I think that is a huge advantage. If you buy fonts and if you uh, can get a BX font and you have the software that runs to the BX format, then by, you know, by all means, it's gonna make it much easier to just type in your letters and do layouts, and it's gonna be you know, much better than getting stitch files. So I'm a big fan of that. Now, we don't have any BX fonts. Originally, I had thought about converting our fonts to BX, but to be honest, uh, in my opinion, there's a lot of limitations to a BX font. It's great that it's able to be typed in on keyboards, it's assigned a keystroke, and the software does do its best to resize a file, but you have to remember that it is originally a stitch file. And even though they've turned it into a BX font, it is still a stitch file. As soon as you change the size too abruptly up or down, it will adjust the objects. The software does know enough to go in and adjust the nodes, but it doesn't do it perfectly because it's taking the original size, which might be the top one right there, and it's trying to convert it to a larger size. And I hope you can see the B here. And can, if you can see how it looks all choppy on the edges, it looks like it's basically doing a line and a line and a line. That's because it did not resize very well as it got larger. And that's the problem with the BX font. The other problem is you really can't go in and properly change the fabric types. You can't change the underlay or all of those other things. So uh, they are an advantage, but there is actually a font that's been around for 25 years and just became available in the home industry uh, two years ago, and that is ESA fonts. And I've been on a little bit of a, uh, I guess, what would it be? Like, um, I, I want to tell the world about ESA fonts because they are what commercial embroiders have used for decades, and there's a reason why. They resize perfectly. No matter how big you make them, they are object-based, they're always going to be perfect. 
You can change underlay, you can change stitch types, you can do all kinds of wacky things. This one here is actually a font that originally was about this big in size and I was able to blow it up and automatically change all the attributes because it is not a stitch file. It is literally like a vector file for embroidery. If you know the vector industry, there's two companies, Corel Draw and you know Illustrator. And if you take a Corel Draw file and make it really, really you know, teeny tiny, it will look perfect. And when you blow it up to a billboard, it looks perfect if it is a true vector format. And that's exactly what happens with ESA fonts. So that's where uh, we do have 600 ESA fonts that you can load into the Hatch software. And that does all load within an inexpensive program for 199 bucks. So it's, it's something that I've been at events telling people, you don't have to buy another digitizing program. I'm not saying if you have something already, I'm not trying to sell you software that you already own. The customizer software by Hatch does two things, layout and lettering. And the only difference is, is it gives you the ability to do ESA fonts. Now, I have digitized some pretty small lettering within the ESA fonts. And that's why at the beginning of this, I asked, what do you consider to be small lettering? And did we get any guesses on that, Jen? We did. OK, awesome. Jen's just going to give me a, a couple of examples. People want to still continue to write in. We have okay. 0 0.25 or 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.20. OK, uh, 0.20. Now, here's the thing as well. Uh, obviously, there is a lot of people from the U.S. that are probably with us. There's some Canadians, there's some Australians, there's some people from Europe and all other places in the world. Uh, most embroiderers usually think in text, uh, in size, in millimeters. Uh, so I know that, you know, quarter inch is, you know, getting small and then as you go smaller. Uh, in millimeters, usually 10 millimeters is like a normal size font, which is somewhere around here, okay? eight millimeters starts to get smaller and when you get down to and I'm talking about uppercase not lowercase but when you get down to fonts that are about six millimeters in height uppercase that is actually pretty pretty tiny I did I did have a ruler here and I bet you I can't find it now but that's okay uh, if you don't have a, a you know if you have a metric ruler take a look after it's six mil it's actually pretty small now I've gone smaller than that if I've been manually digitizing fonts, but there is some fonts that I've created within Hatch that actually go pretty tiny. And I'm gonna call up the software and I'm gonna show you a couple of them that I've done. And let me just get right in here. I'm gonna switch over right now, the magic of the internet. There we go. Donna says she does three to four mils all the time with the ESA. With the ESAs, yeah. awesome. You're pushing it, you're pushing it, Donna. Uh, and that is actually really cool because that shows you how small the ESA fonts can go. Now, I'm in the Hatch software right now and I'm gonna call up the small lettering that I've done. And here, if I have, let's see right here, there we go. These are a couple of fonts that I've done that are actually small lettering. And this is the actual size. And if you see this one in particular, this is a font called Block Jock 6 millimeters. That is the smallest font that I've actually done for an ESA or a keyboard font within the program. And it is tiny because if you look at this, I'm just gonna zoom in a bit, I'll zoom into 600% here. If you look at this font, it's six millimeters on the capital, and that means that some of these lowercase letters are going down to probably about four millimeters. And they do stitch out really cleanly at that size. We have others that I've done that are eight millimeters, eight millimeters, this one's a seven millimeter font. So I have quite a few fonts that I've done which are smaller. And the one thing that I did wanna let people know is when you are working with ESA fonts, size does matter a little bit, but it doesn't matter a lot. I could make this lettering as large as I wanted to, so I could do whatever I wanted to, and it's going to stitch out perfectly, change the underlay, do whatever I want it to do. But if I look at this one, here is the same lettering, and this is the same one right here. I took this font right here, and I'm gonna zoom in again. Let's go with my zoom box, come in here. I have this font, which is the original, at six millimeters. And here's where Donna proved me right. This one was actually down to four millimeters, probably about three millimeters on the lower case. And the stitch quality on these 
is perfect. All of these fonts, I, I usually tell people that when you are using an ESA font, which is an object-based font, you can essentially go about two, maybe three millimeters smaller than the size that I suggest. Now, one thing that I did do on all the fonts that I created is I made sure after the word or the name of the font, so if it's called fancy font, I always put the minimum size. So if I thought it was going to be a 15 millimeter font, I wrote fancy font 15. If it's a six millimeter font, it's fancy font six millimeters. And that way it gives you a guideline of the lowest point. As big as you want, I don't really care. But this is actually those same ones that are sewn out. And if you look at this, and hopefully we'll be able to see this, and if you can see the size of my finger here, you can basically see just how you know, small some of these letters are. But that is literally a four millimeter font right there. And it sewed out perfectly. There's absolutely no issues. It sewed out beautifully, and it'll sew on most fabric types. Elmer has a question. We have a question, yep. Yep, and she's asking, when you shrink the lettering, what happens to the spacing? Okay, the, uh, with a regular font, the question was, when you shrink a font or you make it smaller, what happens to the spacing or the density? Uh, in most fonts that you'll purchase, if it's a stitch file, the software will usually do the best that it can to adjust some of the properties. A BX font is the same thing. It will try the best that it can to go in mathematically, you know, redesign it, turn it into outlines, and then try to reduce the, the density of it. With the ESA fonts, it actually knows, and I'm going to go back here just so you can see, I'm going to go back to the uh, Hatch program, and if I come in here right now, I've got to call it up, if I turn off my true view and I look at some of my underlay, you can see how this is the same font, but now it has a zigzag with a center run underlay, and this is the same font, it has a center run. So this software knows uh, when to change the underlay, the density, and the pull compensation based on the size, and it does it automatically. There's no other software that actually changes all of those attributes as you take a you know, font or a letter. I mean, I can come in here and grab one letter if I want to and take this letter and make it essentially you know, bigger or distort it or do whatever I want to it, and it's going to literally you know, uh, change. You can see now it's changed all the underlay for that just in that area. So there's so many things that you can do that will automatically change compared to most other fonts that are out there. I could, if I wanted to, grab this font, and let me just come here now, and if I know that this font is going to be going on a material that is going to sink in, I'll go to my stitching, and I can take that center run, change it to an edge run, and I can say I don't want normal edge run, but I want medium, and hopefully you can see that it actually ran a perfectly placed edge run within just those objects, and here we have a center run. Now the other thing that is uh, incredible about ESA fonts is I do have the ability to go in and actually change an entire design. I can go to Auto Fabrics, and right now all of these fonts are set to microfiber. If I want to sew these on stretchy terry cloth, I can literally click a button and it just changed the attributes of whatever was selected to whatever fabric type I want. So that's kind of the really cool thing, is um, there's no the limitation. The cool thing, yes. she's saying that um, a lot of the stitch files will automatically get very dense in the middle of the O's or the E's, they okay. get filled in, and she feels that ESA fonts handles those differently. Okay, if you didn't hear what my lovely wife, Janet, my assistant Vanna said, she said that uh, Donna had mentioned that a lot of fonts, when you make them smaller, they tend to get very stitch intensive on corners or in the centers of O's. And within the ESA fonts, they actually don't do that. They uh, will readjust themselves based on the shape and the size that you choose. So it, it is, it's an incredible thing. Uh, you have to remember that commercially, when we ran production, 
if we had golf shirts running or we had, let's say, polar fleece shirts, I would not use the same embroidery file for both. That's just crazy because the densities for polar fleece are different than they are for PK knit and we used this technology 20 years ago. The, uh, the home market didn't really know it was available until recently. Now, I am going to show you some of the smallest lettering I've ever done and this file was actually digitized I'm guessing it might be almost 20 years ago and it was done in the Wilcom software. Uh, uh, the Wilcom software, it actually writes out EMB format, the same format that Hatch does, which is a huge advantage for me personally, because you can get my designs and do whatever you want with them, because I supply the EMB format. But this one here, I'm going to go back to the software, I'm going to call up my Hatch program, and I just have to find it real quick. I think it is right here. Okay, This is a file, you can see hopefully on your screen, this is the actual size of the design and that's at a one-to-one -one scale. Now I'm going to go to my six-to-one scale just to zoom in and if you look at this design right here and keep in mind that there is some lines going across here, okay? The reason why is this was done 20 years ago and there was no actual trim functions in it. We actually had machines where I had to do something kind of special. I'll remind me, Jennifer, to tell them when I have a visual and I'm going to show you what we had to do in the old days. But if you look at these letters, these lowercase letters right here, the E and the I, this says a new millennium of memories. And these are probably about two millimeters in height, maybe two and a half millimeters, and they actually are legible on the fabric. Now the way I did that, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit more, is they were actually digitized like an old Meisnergram machine used to do it. If you've never heard of a Meisnergram machine, it's a machine that only went one direction. It only went Y. It did not go X. It didn't, it didn't have a, a sash frame or a frame that moved in different directions. It only went horizontally. And if you look at all these stitches, I'm going to turn off the true view, the A and a lot of the, the bar of the E there, it is all defined by a single direction. I do not have an ESA font that replicates this because the only way to do this type of effect and actually have it so that it turns out legibly is to actually do it one stitch at a time manually. So every single point that you see down there, it was done the old school way, and yes, it took me a long time to create that font. Now I'm going to bring back up the camera so I can give you a visual. Uh, the, the thing is, as I said, all of those letters only went one direction. So the bar on an A is just literally a stitch back and forth. Okay? And if you look at this design, here's the actual size, okay? and you can see how small it is, and I'll try to zoom in and hopefully you'll see it. I know the camera is going to go out of focus a little bit, but it does actually uh, you know, say uh, a new millennium of memories, and when you do visually look at this, you can read it. But now I'm at the age where if I want to read it, I have to put on my glasses. My wife is laughing. Uh, I didn't have to wear glasses till a few years ago. But that's how tiny those fonts are. So doing really, really small fonts is something that can be done. Okay? Uh, if you are a digitizer and you actually want to learn how to create them, you only need one tool in your software. You do not need to own Hatch. You can own any program. Uh, just so everybody knows, we do teach on 10 different software programs. We do, we're a Hatch reseller, but if you own, you know, P Designs, Palette, you own the Artista software, Genomi software, uh, the Dime software, the Floriani software, we have lessons for all of those. And if you want to do really small lettering, all you need to know how to do is a running stitch. And every program has one. So I'm going to go back to my software and I'm going to call up my Hatch software and I'm going to bring up some artwork called Small Lettering. Okay, uh, A lot of people are liking this so that's cool. Uh, I, I love doing things on lettering. Now this is where it gets a little intense though. This is where those of you who want to buy your fonts, you might be interested in this but this is really what goes into actually making a font. I am going to zoom in to my 6 to 1 scale. So I'm going to go F6. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, we cover that in our videos too. And I'm going to dim my artwork a little bit, so oops, not that much. I'm going to dim my artwork so I can see it on screen a little bit better. 
So I'm gonna go into here and just tell it to dim the artwork a little bit. And now I'm gonna to go to my digitizing tools and I'm going to choose a running stitch. And I'm gonna choose a darker color so you can see what I'm doing on screen. And I'm going to come in here, let's just backspace, and I'm gonna to start to put my points down. I'm gonna put a point right here, a point here. And this is where I'm gonna to start to go back and forth and I'm literally going to create a font that is only going one direction. So I'm gonna go here, here, and here. And then when I come to this point, I'm gonna go over here, go over here, come over to the other side, go back down, and come over to here, come over to the other side, walk over to here, go up the other side, and I'm doing all of this manually. Every stitch that's going down is a single stitch in place, but the result when it's done will actually be a legible font. And to give you an idea of how, how small these are, this is probably about a uh, maybe three millimeter, three to four millimeter font that I'm creating. So here I'm gonna enter, and now you can see that I have very few stitches that are actually creating that. Uh, if I need to go in and edit anything, I can actually come in here, grab that one, move it over a little bit. But if you can see that uh, horizontal movement, there's actually no turning of the letters. As I get larger, then I can start to turn the letters. So if I go over to a fill and a satin, and if I want to do something that is a little bit bigger, then I can come in here and I can start turning these objects. My computer is clicking magically all by itself. so. I uh, apologize for this, but it's creating points without me wanting them to be created. Uh, it's caught up with me a little bit now. And I wonder how many people digitize smaller than five mil. Yeah, is, is there anybody out there that's currently manually digitizing fonts that are smaller than five mil? Awesome. I mean, it, it is, and uh, my software is not reacting very nicely for me, but it is actually a process of literally put it, putting all of your points down and you can see how I'm cutting short in that area and I'm doing this object now and then I'll go right to here and I'm cutting short on the bottom one as well so there here and here I am running other secondary software right now so I'm getting a lot of lag time on my computer which I normally don't get so I'm finding that it's not keeping up with me like that was not keeping up with me, but I'll go here and here. And you can see just how small these objects are. They are tiny, tiny, but when they stitch out, and this is the one-to-one -one scale, that's literally how small these fonts are going to be. So if you want to have fonts that run really, really well, that are super, super small, I gotta be honest with you, the only way to really do that is either to use an ESA font that was digitized by somebody who knows what they're doing and you can probably do a four millimeter font with an ESA keyboard font or manually digitize them from scratch. Okay? Uh, I will also say, as I mentioned, the BX fonts are great. There are hundreds and hundreds of companies out there that do supply BXA fonts, BX fonts. And my only issue is, out of those hundreds of companies that sell their fonts, you have to remember that they were all manually digitized by somebody. And was that somebody really a good digitizer? That's why some people buy fonts and they will run them and not really have good results. And they blame their machine, they blame the stabilizer, they blame everything. But to be honest, the only person you can blame if a stitch file is not running well is the person who created the file. So that's really where you either learn how to do it or you find reputable companies where you know you get consistent quality over and over again and then you're always going to be safe. Did we have any questions? Yes, yeah, I have a question. I don't think we covered it. They're asking if you discussed the cotton weight that you use. Okay, uh, the question was did I discuss the cotton weight? Uh, generally, I don't use cotton threads uh, for embroidery. They have a tendency to leave fluffies and they aren't quite as strong as polyester. Uh, we used rayon in the old days. These days I'm using uh, polyester threads. My standard weight thread and that design that I showed you earlier that was really tiny. Oh, I have it right here. Uh, this one right here with the tiny, tiny little letters. This was using a 40 weight thread. 
So that's a regular 40 weight embroidery thread that you'd get from any company out there. If you want to experiment with finer threads, like 60 weight threads, then there are lots of companies. Floriani has them, Sulky has them, uh, Madeira has them. You can actually get finer weight threads. I do suggest if you do that and you want to start playing, make sure that you get the appropriate size needle for one, and two, make sure that you adjust the spacing or the density of those files because the finer the thread, the more density you're going to need. So. Polyester. Yeah, polyester is pretty much the mainstay in embroidery these days. Uh, if you've seen any of our videos on, on lace, where you know we have lace that was done back in the 50s, uh, our lace designs originally were done in rayon. And the reason why is back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, into the 80s, and up until the beginning of the 90s, polyester wasn't available. It did not, when it first came out, it didn't have a nice sheen. It was actually very dull looking. So most commercial embroiderers did not use polyester. Rayon was the thread of choice, even though it wasn't color fast. Uh, but now, to be honest, I use polyester because it is less expensive than the other thread, uh, than rayon generally, and it's stronger, uh, which is a really positive thing. Uh, it can be a negative thing because I joke about this at shows, and I'll say it publicly here, uh, with polyester being the thread of choice in today's industry, especially the home embroidery industry, it has allowed people to create the most uh, sorry, stitch intensive designs ever made in the history of embroidery. Uh, you can sometimes break a needle or your machine before you'll break a thread. That's how strong the thread is. And that's why there's so many bulletproof designs out there, designs that you know, uh, embroidery should be nice and soft. It should feel like part of the garment, not like it was ironed on with glue. So now, now hopefully that helped you. Now, just so you guys know, I am doing a, uh, it looks like a four part series on small lettering. So we touched on things here. I'm gonna be doing a four part series on small lettering text and digitizing, explaining some of the stuff that we've done and that will be available on YouTube. All that education is absolutely free. Uh, we are stepping up our games. I, I, I ask that you do uh, tell all your friends about us, share us, you know, con I, I have my son James getting involved now and we have tons of videos that have been shot and are being shot. Uh, if you watched our Hatch Facts, Jennifer and I have been very, very happy the last few days because we're empty nesters right now. We have no kids at home. All the kids are in Canada, 1,300 miles away. So, uh, <laughs> for, John's happy. Yeah, I'm <laughs> Hmm, I don't know. She just said John's happy. Okay, anyways, I'm happy. Okay, <laughs> anyway, okay. Uh, I lost my train of thought now. We're... Uh, <laughs> Okay, uh, we do have one other thing we're going to do before we close up, and that is actually a little product reveal. And this one, I gotta be honest, I am super, super excited about. Uh, it was almost a year ago, we actually uh, got what's called the Echidna Hooping Station into our facility, and the supplier, Echidna Sewing in Australia, great friends of ours, uh, we, we love you guys. Uh, they actually had invented, Gary had invented a hooping station that just amazed me. And the reason why is I saw it being used in an event that I was doing. We did a lace event with, uh, you know, Couture Martin that was giving an incredible class and I gave a class on doing some of our lace insertions and all that. And he showed me this hooping station that he came up with and I was amazed. The reason why is I think every person in the room went home with one. That's number one. But the real reason why is it was easy to use and so simplistic. So we got these in a year ago and we were a little shocked at what happened. We ended up selling out of inventory in probably maybe what, six, seven weeks? Yeah. So we showed them at events and we were at consumer shows and seven weeks later we had completely sold out of our inventory and we thought this is amazing we are really happy about that so we thought we have to reorder and we went and reordered with Gary and we had a little hiccup uh, the way they were manufactured before could not be done and we had to uh, go through a lengthy process of getting mold injections done getting a new supplier to do them uh, quality testing all that kind of stuff and after almost a year I'm talking literally a year we now actually have them in stock 
they are back and we are going to be showing them at all of our fall shows and we actually have a pretty long uh, waiting list people who wanted to be notified when they did come in and I'm gonna give you a, a quick little demo on what makes these hooping stations so unique now this do we have I was just gonna say, Donna says she loves her. Is anybody else watching that has one? Yeah, is anybody else watching who has an echidna hooping station right now? And Donna, I, I know you love yours, and give me a thumbs up if you actually have one. Uh, this one, and, and this is the kind of new improved model, so it's gonna be even a little bit better. So Donna, maybe, maybe Donna wants to gift that one to a friend for Christmas and can get the newer version. <laughs> that would be a, a really uh, cool thing to do. <laughs> She's probably not commenting right now. I probably got an unhappy face. No, Leanne's asking if we're gonna take it on the cruise. <laughs> uh, yeah, we are hopefully scheduling a cruise in Australia. Nothing's confirmed yet, but we are looking into it. So hopefully in uh, November of next year, early November, because I know we don't want to hit any storms, we are going to be hopefully doing a digitizing cruise in Australia. So we're looking forward to that. Um, but I'm going to switch over the camera now, and I'm going to show you the new hooping stations. This is new technology for us. We actually are able now to have two cameras going at the same time. So now I'm here. Hi. And now I'm back over here. That's pretty cool, isn't it? I won't do that for too long, but I'm, I'm like a big kid. I, I, li I like toys. So this is my new toy. And Jennifer is my lovely camera person. So I'm going to swing over my mic, swing over my light. And um, there we go. We're only a crew of two here. I'll try to yell, yell a little bit so you guys can actually hear me. These are the Echidna hooping stations. And the really cool thing about these are they are boards that actually are double-sided. So within each of the stations, you have a youth and ladies size, and then you have a men's size that'll take anywhere from a you know, small to a double XL, even larger if you need to. And then the other station actually does things like EB bears and onesies. And when you flip it over, you actually have a arm for doing sleeves or pant legs or a socks, anything that is a hard to hoop item. What's that? Pockets. Pockets, anything like that. Now the really cool thing about this is, as I said, the new ones are mold injected. They are incredibly strong right now. And the one thing that I love is the non-slip surface with the metal plate that's behind there is now recessed into the mold injected board. So it actually even functions better than the previous version. And the beauty of it is, it actually works on the principles of magnets, okay? And this is where Gary is a genius. And I, I hope he's watching, and I hope I get a discount on my next shipment for, no, just kidding, I wouldn't expect that, Gary. But these are ingenious because we found that these boards actually work with any hoop, whether it's a home hoop, or whether it's a commercial hoop, or whether it is a hoop for your multi-needle brother machine or baby lock machine, it works with every single brand. Most hooping stations that I've seen in, on market actually have a pegboard system where you need to get different plates and positionings for every single machine you have because they all have slightly different hoops. So this is universal. A lot of people have more than one brand of machine. Now I'm going to give you a very, very quick demo. And uh, excuse me for one sec, Jen. I'm just going to come over here and get my other hoop. This will be the uh, very quick demo that I give. Keep in mind, we do have a new video that has just gone up. And it, it is a video that is geared to be like an infomercial, okay? So I apologize because it's a little corny, but we actually did it to be that old 80s, 90s infomercial style. And one thing that I have to say, and this is why you guys, after we're done here, you gotta click on that video and watch it because I actually talked my wife Jennifer into appearing on this video. She's sticking her tongue out at me right now. Yes, she is, okay? And can you see the camera shaking a little? It's because she's laughing. So anyways, she's actually in this video. So uh, you've got to take a look and give her a thumbs up, and uh, hopefully she wins an Oscar. So here is why these hooping stations are so incredible. I can take my hoop, 
And if I want to hoop one of these, this is an ED bear. And if you've ever tried to hoop an ED bear, it is incredibly difficult to do on a flat surface. You end up struggling to get your stabilizer inside, to lay it down flat, get your hoop on the inside. And after you're done, usually, you can come up here for a second, usually after you're done, you go to look at the stabilizer and it's moved out of position. And after two or three of them, you're frustrated. I mean, it happens with onesies or anything that you're doing. So the idea of this is, I can take my hoop, it's a non-slip surface, and then I use these incredibly powerful magnets. I think Gary sourced these on Saturn or Mars. They, they are out of this world how strong these little magnets are. But you put your magnet in place, that hoop is going absolutely nowhere, and then you take your piece of stabilizer, and you will put it in place just like this so that your stabilizer is also being held in by a couple of magnets. So you know that's not going to move anywhere. Now, camera up here for a second. This is wrong on so many levels. I just have to say that. But what you're going to do is you're going to take this poor animal and you're going to slide him over top of your hooping station. And I'll just make sure that he is pulled tauntly, and then I'm going to take my hoop, and I'm going to make sure that it's all out of the way, and I'm going to push forward and down with one motion. Now, unfortunately, I think I need to loosen my hoop a little bit. Yes, I do. Give me one sec. This is live TV, obviously. So let me just loosen that. And I'm going to put that back over top. And now, hopefully, we are going to do this. We're going to slide him over top one more time. Make sure that he's pulled all the way down. And then we're going to go down and forward. There we go. Jennifer, help me. <laughs> oh, I did not get this uh, loose enough, guys. This is, this is the wonderful thing of live TV. I did not loosen my hoop properly. Give me one sec. Maybe you can give him a little um, Yeah, a little demo. Okay. And, uh, well, here's, here's usually... Okay, here, I'll come back to my face for a sec. Here's usually how I will loosen a hoop. Usually what I do is I take the item that I'm going to be hooping and I fold it over one time and I'll kind of squeeze lightly between the two pieces and I can see between my fingers uh, right there, the space that I can see between my fingers is the space that I need to leave on the hoop. And I'll usually hoop, uh, loosen the hoop enough so that I can see that space right there between my fingers. And that now should be enough so that when I place my hoop in place, and again, it is in position properly, and I'm going to put my stabilizer back down with the magnets, and I'm gonna slide him back over top, and hopefully, third time's a charm. We did actually plan this uh, small lettering live, three times. So we actually had three different times that we scheduled it. So I guess the hooping station is the same deal. There we go. So now he's in place. Now the beauty is once the hoop goes down in place, all I have to do is lift up and pull out. And what you're going to find is that the stabilizer has actually not moved at all. The stabilizer is right in there. It's in place. It didn't move or shift. And if we look at the actual tension on the hooping, it is actually 100% drum tight. So if you preset your hoop properly, you won't struggle with actually having to do an item like this, which is usually incredibly difficult to actually try to hoop on a flat surface. Now it does work on the same principles uh, with regards to garments. Uh, we actually do have on our site an option for people who do want to purchase the combo where you can add one of these to your purchase. And I added these because, in my opinion, these are an embroiderer's best friend. And if you've ever tried the embroiderer's helper, uh, this actually gives you a guide for doing placement on left chest anywhere from a men's small to a men's extra large and different, you know, basically sizes, whether it's a golf shirt or whether it's a t-shirt, and it gives you the positioning of exactly where you should mark your uh, points when you're actually hooping for different sizes. There's also one that gives you an alignment 
for doing pocket toppers and it shows you exactly where to place your starting point on your designs. So we do have another video coming out where I actually show people how to use one of these tools to set up your hoop one time and one time only so that anytime you want to do a men's medium all you have to do is follow the little circles that you've drawn on your hooping station put your hoop right in place for a medium and then move it over a little for a large move it over a little for an extra large and you are ready to go right away so these are incredible they work they're simple in design and they are just awesome. Now, we do have, and I'm gonna come back over here to the screen, and I gotta love this technology. Okay, I'm back now. Uh, we do have them on special. For two weeks only, as an introduction, we have them on special. And if you go and you click onto the link, for the next two weeks, we are offering $50 off. So you can get $50 off on the combo set. And I'm just gonna to go to a slide, because I do have it right here. So normally the combo is $4.99 and you can get them for the next two, two weeks for $4.49. But wait, there's more. We actually, I had to say that, as I said, the infomercial thing. Uh, we do have a bonus. What we're doing is for the next two weeks, we are actually giving a design bonus. These are design packs. There's actually five different packs in each of these bundles and we are giving two of these away with each purchase. We actually have a $300 retail value on these when we used to sell them at events, and that was uh, you know, just a few years ago, and you'll actually get two of these uh, you know, design bonuses and $50 off, and will include shipping within the continental US. So it is a fantastic deal. After the two weeks, you'll still get one bundle, you'll still get one bundle valued at 300 and we'll still cover the shipping, but it'll be $50 more. So take a peek at the actual video. Uh, also, if you do get a chance, please uh, visit our site and see our upcoming events. We are have a, a crazy busy fall. Uh, next week, I think it is, we're going to be at Amy Bauman's. We have a digitizing day. We have a two-day uh, hands-on sewing event. The week after that, we're going to be in Dallas for a two-day digitizing event. Uh, we actually have a digitizing event in Tampa. We have a how to make money with embroidery in Tampa. Then we're in Fort Myers doing another digitizing one day event and then a two day hands on event. And then Jennifer and I are going on a cruise for 11 days with no children. So that's awesome, awesome. So, maybe you ask us any questions? Yeah, any, any questions before we tie up guys on the fonts or anything else? Uh, there is going to be lots of videos uh, coming up on font specifically. I know that it's a hot topic and a lot of people, if you understand why fonts are made the way they are, it makes it a lot easier to get better results when you're embroidering them. And obviously hooping is a big part of it as well. So I think we are all done. I, ho I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, God bless and uh, we will see you at the next live session. It might be uh, about three weeks before we do another one because we are going to be on the road, but James and I are going to be doing those events. And if we do have a half decent signal at some of the uh, convention centers, we might do a live straight from the uh, digitizing seminars or wherever we are at the time. So thank you guys and have a great evening.